You're listening to the Rent Roll Radio Show with Sterling Chapman. Hey, Rent Roll Radio listeners, welcome back to the show. As always, I'm your host, Sterling Chapman, and joined here by my co-host and partner, Andrew Bruff. Today, we have a special guest that I'm super excited to have on for a number of reasons. So he was actually one of our earliest guests on the show, probably the first guest that wasn't in my immediate circle of friends. He was on episode seven about a year ago. I reached out to him because I was a big fan of his from uh, the content he puts out on Bigger Pockets and from a book he wrote about apartment investing called The Perfect Investment. And I was really blessed and excited when he responded to my note and, and agreed to be on the show. And then after not only being on the show himself, he must have introduced me to 15 other high profile investors throughout the community. He's probably personally responsible for a majority of the great content that we've put out on the show. So I, I, I was talking to him the other day and I was telling him how grateful I was for all of that. And he said, well, you know, if that's the case, let me come back. I said, we'd absolutely love to have you back on. So Paul Moore, welcome back. Hey, it's great to be here. And I had no idea those introductions went anywhere. I didn't know. And I'm so, so grateful that you got to interview those guys and that it worked out well. Absolutely. So, Paul, for those of our listeners that didn't catch the first show, can you give us a kind of a brief introduction of your background and how you got into real estate investing and kind of what you've been up to lately? Yeah, absolutely. So, I had an engineering degree, then a business degree, and then I had my own company. Sold that in 97, got into house flipping in 2000, got into flipping waterfront lots in 2004, did a small subdivision in 2008, did a commercial multifamily property in North Dakota after that during the oil boom there, and was always trying to figure out how to get into commercial real estate systematically. That one off deal we did in multifamily there was just that. And so I did a mentoring program that really changed my life. And That mentoring program was learning to syndicate, learning to do large-scale multifamily. I ended up writing the book you mentioned, and now we have Wellings Capital, which helps people who want to invest in commercial real estate, but they're not sure who to trust or where to start. We're giving them an inroad, an on-ramp, if you will, to the large-scale commercial real estate world. We do a lot of due diligence and we only invest with the very best operators we can find, and we give hundreds of investors the chance to partner with us to jump in on these large projects. Awesome. So a couple things that I wanted to point out, and I don't know if anything's changed since the last time we we talked or, or had you on, but you are the guy who wrote the book, The Perfect Investment, about apartment buildings. But the last time we talked to you, you weren't investing in apartment buildings anymore. You were focusing, I think, exclusively in mobile home parks and self-storage facilities. Is that still the case? Why would someone who wrote The Perfect Investment not be invited? (laughs) Silly you. No, seriously. My next book, I I, I was on a podcast about a year ago and I said, I think I'm going to write another book called The Perfecter Investment. The show host didn't get it. It was really awkward, but I'm glad that you you guys get it. No, seriously. um, Yeah, The Perfect Investment is a great, I mean, multifamily is a great investment. And I mean, the demographics are super strong. You've got millennials who are renting more than buying. You've got baby boomers who are actually the fastest growing, yet still smallest group, demographic group going into apartments. And when they rent, they usually don't ever buy again. You've got immigrants who are largely driving a lot of the multifamily boom around America and that continues and they rent more often and for longer than folks who were born in the U.S. And now you've got Gen Z and it's possible that Gen Z will have even a stronger bent towards renting than owning. We really don't know yet since they're 24 and under. At any rate, we are really excited about multifamily. However, there's a limit. Anything that's overpriced, even if all the demographics are right and all the numbers look perfect, if it's overpriced, if it's 
just too high, then there's a time to push a pause on it. And so we pushed a pause on it after years of beating our head against the wall and realizing multifamily is really high right now. And though there are people out there who are finding great deals and I'm jealous of them. We didn't have a great acquisition team. And so we weren't finding those off-market deals as somebody who had only been in the business several years versus people who've been in the business like Brian Burke, who'd been doing it for 20 or 30 years. So we decided to expand into self-storage and mobile home parks. Okay. How have those assets been performing since you've been, since you've been involved in them? Well, one thing we really like is that, you know, 93% of multifamily above 50 units is owned and operated by corporations who have already taken the value add opportunities off the table in many cases. Self-storage and mobile home parks, so 90% of mobile home parks, we believe, are owned by mom and pop operators. We believe about 40 of the 45,000 are owned by mom and pop single site operators who don't have the desire or the resources or the knowledge to improve the mobile home park. Hey, they don't need to. They might only have a million dollars in a park that's now valued at 10 million and they're making all the money they want to. And so they don't raise rents to keep up with market. They don't fill empty spaces. They don't do all kinds of things. A whole, I mean, one I'm under contract and involved in right now has a $50 annual marketing budget and they are a $1.1 million revenue park. (laughs) $50. So they don't have to. And by acquiring these non-professionally run mobile home parks, and self-storage, there's a tremendous opportunity that we haven't seen in multifamily for a little while. So Wellings Capital operates in funds. So y'all are not yeah. actually going in and acquiring the assets yourself. You're, right. You're investing with other operators. So if you come across other operators that have multifamily assets, do you invest part of the fund in them as well? Or have you you've decided to exclusively invest with the mobile home park and self-storage operators? Our fund is set up to invest heavily with self-storage, mobile home parks, and multifamily. We will invest in multifamily if we find the right operator with the right deal that makes sense. Unfortunately, in the last three years, we haven't found one. Now, it it could be that reticular activator thing, you know, or whatever it's called, where you're only seeing what you're looking for. We have been mainly focused on finding the very best self-storage and mobile home park operators with an eye toward next year jumping back into multifamily if the economy has the shock that we've, many of us are still expecting. And if there are distressed multifamily assets, that's when we plan to jump back in. That was my next question. So right when uh, COVID hit, I think I sent you an email saying like, hey, what do you think is going to happen? And I think everything was apocalyptic at the time, but now we're 10 months you know, down the road. <laughs> I wouldn't say past it, but down the road. <laughs> what is your outlook today on the future, the economy? And granted, you know, a lot of things could change between today and the day we released the episode, but right now it's mm-hmm. October 30th, a, a week before the election. What do you foresee for the next year in our markets? Hmm. Sterling, I'm, I'm continuing in a growing minority with this, but I'm joined by Howard Marks, who I respect a lot. He wrote a book called Mastering the Market Cycle, and he's raised $15 billion dollars in commitments at least, to invest in distressed assets in the coming downturn. And of course, he could be wrong, and I could certainly be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. As I look on Wall Street, and as I look in commercial real estate and single family, I think, man, things have never been better. But as I look on Main Street, I see one after another after another business closed permanently. And we could talk the rest of the show about examples of that. And so I got to believe there's a problem brewing. I can't believe that printing money is going to fix this problem forever. 
And so there are so many ways things could go bad. I've got to believe that 2021 or 2022 is going to hold some very significant shocks to the economy. I hope I'm wrong. So how is that going to impact the price of multifamily assets? So often we hear about housing, you know, crashing significantly and it's based off the cops and there's a direct correlation to the economy. But multifamily, a lot of times we hear, oh, well, you know, you control the the value of it by increasing the net operating income. Mm-hmm. So how is that negatively impacted by what you're talking about? Yeah, I don't know where they're at with this now, but Green Street Advisors said in March or April, I think it was April, they expected instead of a 2% annual NOI growth in multifamily, they would put it, you know, like by 2023, I think that would have a 6% growth or I think it was 8% growth by then. They expected a, a four, I think it was a four to 6% drop in NOI. It could have been in rents or NOI. If it was in rents, that would be even worse on the NOI, as you can understand. But I still think that's very likely. If that happens, these highly over leveraged deals counting on appreciation might have some trouble. Now, in the last downturn in 2008, there were very, very few large apartments foreclosed on which is part of my argument in the perfect investment, that it's a great place to be in a bad time. And I still believe that every bit as much as when I wrote the book four or five years ago. But even if there's only a, well, even a half a percent, even if half percent of all the multifamily loans go bad, that's still a heck of a lot of deals out there that we could potentially scrape up. And we could actually help the banks and help the sellers by bailing them out and still do well ourselves. So what is new with Wellings Capital these days? Well, we are promoting the Wellings Income Fund too, and we're investing with self-storage and mobile home park operators that we've done what we believe to be extreme due diligence on. We are really enjoying that. There's a lot of upside. We just had three assets sell about a month ago this week and three of the assets that sold, one of them had a 500% return on equity. I know that sounds crazy, like this guy's got to be lying, but it was bought for cash, quickly upgraded. The cash was taken off the table only four months in to the deal and then it was sold 18 months later. That's the quick summary of it. So when you do a deal like that, it's pretty easy to get a really high return on equity in a deal like that. We're looking at a lot of deals that are potentially going to go that way. And that's the beauty of investing in a mom and pop. That's the beauty of finding a distressed, you know, the economy might not be at all distressed, but mom and pop sellers are always distressed in my book. And that's the beauty of investing this way. We have had a lot of frustration though. We've got 1031 exchange investors who have come to us for the last couple years and we haven't been able to help them. One of them called me a year and a half ago and said, hey, I got $2.1 million in a 1031 exchange. I'm going to go ahead and invest. I think it was $450,000 in your fund, but I want to invest in this. I want to do a 1031 exchange as well. Well, we couldn't help him. And we couldn't even tell him where to go for help because he wanted, he was 72 and he also wanted to get out of the active real estate game. He wanted to get into a passive game. Well, he was pretty upset and pretty stressed trying to find a 1031 replacement property where he wouldn't have to be involved much. And he called me a month later, all happy. He was going out to play tennis and he said, great news. I discovered the Delaware Statutory Trust. I said, you went to Delaware? What now? And he said, no, I discovered the DST, the Delaware Statutory Trust. Have a great day. And, you know, I mean, it was, I'm exaggerating, but you get the point. He was happy. And so I went and looked into these and I, it just, it opened a whole new vista for Wellings Capital. So that's what we're working on these days, setting up a Delaware Statutory Trust for 
1031 exchange investors and also just any investor who wants a stabilized, no hassle, no drama commercial real estate investment. I heard about that the other day and you mentioned that and what an amazing product. I mean, I've, I've had uh, customers that have come to me and, you know, 1031, it's, it's sometimes a stressful situation because they're trying to find a property or mm-hmm. have to close the deal within 180 days. And it's, it's a very, uh, can be very stressful situation. So, yeah, it's really true. Yeah. Tell us more about it, please. Yeah, so I just talked to a lady who was selling a cell tower lease. And I thought, oh, well, I know how much those sell for, at least in rural Virginia, 120000 I mean, that obviously it varies, but that's a real standard number. And so I'm thinking, oh, you know. And she said, yeah, I'm selling this cell tower lease for $1.25 I said, really? Wait, do you own the tower too? Anyway, so... She said she was really just, I mean, she didn't say this, but she was clearly really distressed. She's like, what am I going to do with this money? I've got 45 days to find three replacement properties. She said, my husband's a handyman, but he doesn't want to spend his time fixing toilets and dealing with tenants and trash and all these things that I hear all the time. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you could consider a DST. A Delaware statutory trust is for anybody who wants to continue to 1031 exchange. And for the few people on who are listening who don't know what that is, a 1031 exchange is a swap where you swap property A through an exchange mechanism for property B. It's a brilliant strategy. It was codified, from what I understand, in 1930s in the U.S. tax code. And it was fought hard and won in a starker Supreme Court battle in recent decades. And the 1031 exchange is a great vehicle, but the IRS doesn't like it. The IRS, as you can imagine, doesn't like the fact that now people can kick the can down the road and they can do it several times, or if they're older, they can do it one time. And if they pass away, or if their spouse passes away, depending on what state you're in, the second death, they can pass that along to their kids with no capital gains and no tax on all the income, you know, all the money they saved all those years. Commercial real estate, it's famous for saving on taxes, right? Well, they can pass away and that reset basis means their kids never have to pay that tax. Well, the IRS hates this. So the IRS was charged with putting into enacting this law. And so they seemed to be a little irritated that decade, and they put in all these egregious regulations, paperwork, time deadlines, all this pressure that make it almost, well, not impossible, make it very, very hard to pull off a 1031 exchange. Andrew, didn't you say you knew somebody who recently tried one and abandoned it? Yes, they, they actually uh, they had the property lined up they were about to purchase it. However, uh, there were some issues with the seller and the time ran out and they ended up go. having to pay the capital gains. And how much? I think it was 600000 mm. Wow, anyway, that's really painful. Yeah. I sold a 125-unit apartment building, our team did, uh, a number of years ago and the buyer was in a 1031 exchange and he misunderstood the deadlines. And he thought he had more than enough time and he missed his window too, but he went ahead and closed. And I can't imagine how irritated he must be at this point still. But anyway, so people want to, number one, they want to keep their capital gains tax deferred. They want to keep a lot of other taxes that they would have paid along the way deferred. Again, commercial real estate's famous for that. And they also want to get into a less active state. In other words, they, like my friend, want to go play tennis at age 72. They don't want to be managing an 80-unit apartment building. And that's what he could have bought, by the way, instead of the DST. So a Delaware Statutory Trust is a professionally managed asset that allows people with 1031 exchanges to fractionally come in and buy shares of this DST 
And when they buy shares of the DST, they're able to keep the 1031 exchange and they're able to also have nothing else to worry about for the next seven to 10 years except how to get to the mailbox to collect their check because it's a completely passive investment. And at the end of the DST, let's say in 10 years, they can exchange it through a 1031 exchange for a share in another DST, or if they're bored, they can go back to active management at that point and they still keep the tax deferrals in the air. They don't have to pay the capital gains. So it doesn't matter where the money comes from. It all 1031s into the Delaware Stationary Trust, right? Yeah. So Sterling, the money can come from a prior 1031 exchange and it almost always does, but the money could also come just through the sale of stocks and bonds. It could come through anything else. Of course, you know, the capital gains deferral comes when it's a 1031 exchange. I mean, it could be 1031 from basically any type of asset. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, any type of real estate asset. Sure. Sure. Right. Yeah. There was a time as you guys remember, that it could have been, you can sell a truck and buy another truck and do a 1031 or an airplane. But that's not possible anymore based on the new tax law. So what differentiates your DST versus uh, other DSTs out there? Well, I didn't tell the whole story on my tennis player friend. He called me back and he's really happy with the cash flow. He said he's getting more cash flow from this than the thing he used to have to actively manage. But he said it really bothered him that he had to pay a 6% sales commission to a third party that had nothing to do with the operation itself. And I looked into DSTs and I found out that the common sales commissions were 5 to 9%. And that's paid to a third party. That's just a salesperson. You're just putting gas in their BMW and that's it. And so he was irritated. He had $2.1 million times 6%. That's like 120 something thousand. He was going to have to pay in a sales commission to a broker dealer. And it really bugged him. Well, he was a very, very smart attorney. And he actually worked on a few famous cases. And he was able to negotiate them down from 6 to 3%. And I thought that was brilliant. And I said, well, that's amazing. That's great. Well, he called me just this Tuesday, a year and a half later, and he said, I heard about your DST. I'm glad I could help. But now that I see you have zero commission on the front end, I wish I'd have invested with you. And he was sort of kidding me and teasing me. Why didn't you do it sooner? So we have zero front end commission. We have zero load. And that's giving all that additional money, if you will. It's staying in the investment And that matters over, you know, a 7% commission over 10 years. That's, you know, 0.7% a year. Well, that adds up. Another thing we have is we have an upside on the back of ours. And for the life of me, Andrew, I can't figure out why everybody doesn't. Because commercial real estate, in theory, is all going to appreciate. I mean, you wouldn't buy something that you knew was going to be a depreciating asset I was going to make a joke about Venezuela, but I'll skip it. Anyway, you wouldn't want a depreciating asset. So, I mean, every asset appreciates and the DST laws are very clear. It's, it all should go in the pocket of the investors. It shouldn't ever go back to the operator. But somehow or another, 25 of the 30 DSTs we carefully reviewed had no upside. And the average upside on the ones that were reported, the five that were reported only was one and a half percent a year. Well, one and a half percent a year is something, but that was all. Well, our DST has a six percent yield. Oh, by the way, they all have a yield and it's typically four to seven percent, though there are exceptions. Four to seven percent per year is what the investor should be getting paid. It should be a great candidate for tax deferrals because like any other commercial real estate, It has a cost segregation study and it's got accelerated depreciation. It's got paper losses for years. Everything about normal commercial real estate is true here. But 
In addition to the 6% yield on our DST, we have a, a 4 to 6% back-end appreciation. Now, it's projected, so if the economy does something really wonky, it might be different than 4 to 6%, but we're projecting 4 to 6% on the back-end. So the lady I talked to earlier with the cell tower thing, let's say she put a million dollars into it, she could expect 60000 a year in income, that's 6% obviously. And at the end of the line in 10 years, she could expect 4 to 6% per year or 400 to 600,000 more in appreciation all in one day. Now, if she wants to keep kicking the can down the road, she's now going to have to reinvest that 1.6 million or whatever into another DST or another property. Awesome. Awesome. So real quick, Paul, we want to hop back into the radio round where we ask some questions to let our listeners get to know you a little bit better. And I'm going to make you give me different answers than you did last time. So the first- Oh no, I can't remember. (laughs) (laughs) I can. So the first, and I, I remember this because I just read the book. The first time I asked you what your favorite book was, you, you told me uh, Gary Keller's The One Thing. And I wrote it down and I intended yeah, to read it. And, and I just finished it about two weeks ago. So it took me a year to get around to it. But I read it and, <laughs> and it was awesome. So thank you for that recommendation. But now, cool, cool. now we want another one. I'm going to give you another one. Mastering the Market Cycle, Getting the Odds in Your Favor by Howard Marks of Oak Tree Capital. It's a great book, and I think especially as we are in times like this, we need to be prepared. We can't predict when the market's going to crash or when it's going to take off. And Howard Marks says that very clearly. But we can act appropriately for where we are in the market, and that's what we need to do. Awesome. What is your favorite quote? My favorite quote that I want to share today I've got several favorite quotes, is that as opposed to speculating, investing should be more like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. I feel like either that was your quote last time or I've just heard you say that on a webinar or something because that sounds really familiar. (laughs) I've said it. That's the third podcast I've said that on today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I say it a lot. My longer quote, I'd have to look up and it would take me a minute and there'd be some dead air and it'd be really awkward. <laughs> we'll, we'll stick with we'll that. that. And then yeah. what's your favorite thing to do outside of work? Well, I mean, that's kind of like in flux. One of my favorite things for sure my son is a land flipper and he buys really large tracts of land. And he just bought one a month or so ago with a cabin on it. And we thought before we went to look at the cabin that it was probably in ruins and it would just be, it was just one of those, you know, tear downs or look at the old log cabin. It wasn't that way at all. It was a beautiful 1988 built two story cabin that is going to be an amazing refuge or a place for our family to go hang out. So I went and spent three days there last weekend and had such a wonderful time. So that's one of my favorite things now. I've been a type A high octane entrepreneur all my life. And so for me to slow down feels really odd. I'm really trying to learn to slow down and I'm learning to journal again and learning just to be quiet and relax. And uh, it's really fun and different. Awesome. Where can our listeners find out more about you? Yeah, they can go to my website, which is wellingscapital.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S, capital, wellingscapital.com. And I've got something. I just fairly recently finished a DST, Delaware Statutory Trust, special report. And if anybody's interested and has an upcoming 1031 exchange or knows somebody who has or just wants to get into a nice stabilized asset, they might want to pick that up. It's free and it will give you a much more complete picture of the perfecter investment. That's the DST. 
Awesome. Well, Paul, thank you so much for coming back on the show. I, I know we learned a ton and I'm sure our listeners did too. It's always a pleasure to have you on. And as always, we'll keep in touch and keep following you. All right. Well, it's really an honor to be here a second time and I uh, really appreciate it, guys. Thanks. You're our, you're our first repeat guest too. So yes. It should be an honor. <laughs> yes. Okay. That makes my weekend. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. Have a great weekend. You Thanks, too. Paul. Thanks for tuning in to the Rent Roll Radio Show brought to you by Cressworth Capital. We hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please hit the subscribe button and leave us a rating and review. You can also visit us at CrestworthCapital.com or RentRollRadio.com or follow us on Facebook at RentRollRadio or at Crestworth Capital. If you would like to reach us, feel free to shoot us an email at info at RentRollRadio.com or sterling at CrestworthCapital.com. We hope you come back next week to join us on some more of our journey. Until then, happy investing.